ഉള്ളതൊന്നും എന്താ പറയുക and let's continue on where we left off so um command line tools they can be um amazing to develop and they can, and they are awesome they are what we use they they are what uh, they are how we run python uh, scripts we usually use python then the name of the scripts and sometimes it has arguments when it has arguments we call it a command line tool and sometimes we have the name of the command line tool um helping us actually start an uh, its own command but in particular when we add arguments to a file what we do is that we want to change that we want, we're adding arguments because we know that input is going to change later on so what can we do to enable us to change our extract functions as uh, however we want and to be able to add files that we want to read today, files that we're going to read for another project, and so forth and so forth. So what I did here is everything you saw earlier, plus a few new files, is going to be in here. The imports that you didn't see earlier were Typer. So Typer is the tool that we're going to be using for cre uh, to create the command line tool that, uh, that we're going to be using. And if you have um, never heard of Typer, It's, a, it's an amazing tool created by um, Sebastian Ramirez. He was also the creator of Fast API, which is a framework for developing APIs in Python. And right now, it's one of the fastest one um, out there. So Typer is a combination of two tools. One is called Click, and the other one is called uh, Rich. The combination of those two gives you command line tool powers, and the other one makes them really pretty. So in addition to that, it also uses Pydantic which Pydantic is a validation tool for data types. So if you want to be very strict about the data that should come in and out of your command line tools, this is one of the best ways to do it. So this is Typer. We're going to be using it. What do you need for it? Well, you need type hints. Have anybody here ever used type hints in Python? Have anybody ever written a function here and you put the input and the output that it's supposed to give you? Yes? No? OK. Maybe not. So you're going to see a little bit of that here in a second. So we have our functions here. We haven't done much with them. But if I wanted to make them type annotated, what I would do is that I would add the colon, and then I would add the type that will follow suit. So I will add, for example, the URL is going to be a string. So I'm going to add the colon str. And then if I want to make it an optional command, then usually what you do is that you add a, oops, um, that you add a none to it or something like that. So if I want to make sure I have the type in the function, I add the type with a colon. And then if I want to make sure I add the type to the output, I add a dash, a um, less than sign. And then I add, for example, uh, it's going to be a string. Or if it's going to be a list, I have to use it with capital L. And I have to import that list type from the typing module, which is part of the Python standard library. So I will do list here, and then I will put it there. It's not going to be a list, but that is how you do type hinting in Python. And it can be quite useful, especially for very large code bases. Uh, the biggest project right now for checking types in Python is called MyPI. It came out of Facebook, and Facebook has, sorry, Instagram. And well, they had already been acquired by Facebook, but it has a really cool story. They had millions and millions and millions of lines of code in Python 2.7 on type, and they migrated all of that into Python 3 and with type hints. They have an amazing, amazing talk about how they did it in, I think, one of the PyCons from two years ago. And I highly recommend uh, that you find it. It's incredible. All right, so with that out of the way, so we can put the types, and we can specify a few things that we want. But for typer in particular, you need two things. You need three things. You need the if the command that you are going to pass in is going to be optional. So the command line tool will not yell at you because you didn't pass it then you're going to add the optional type and then square brackets around the, around the type that you're going to use. I believe right now it only accepts strings. It might accept other types, but I'm not 100% sure because I know it, it yelled at me for putting something other than string when I was uh, developing this. But you need the optional 
for the type of um, the argument that you're accepting. And then you need to tell typer, typer, this is going to be an option. If you put none in it, it also tells typer that it's an optional argument. If you don't put anything here, typer is not going to let you run your command because, uh, sorry, if you don't put anything there and if you don't put optional here, then typer is going to tell you, nope, I do not like that and will not let you run your, um, your command line tool. So we're going to keep that there and then we're going to keep the... Um, the optional none. The other cool thing about Typer is that to be able to create a command line tool, if all of our commands were required, we wouldn't even need to write this here. All we needed, all we would need to do is to put Typer that run main, and we have a command line tool. It's unbelievable. Um, another thing, another important thing to notice: we're going to have arguments in our command in our command line. So that means that we have a couple of underscores here. This is very important for Typer. When you use commands to signal, this is the argument that I'm passing into my function, the underscores are going to become slashes or dashes. So make sure you keep that in mind, because otherwise it, um, it will come back to bite you. And it's only, uh, you can only see it in a small part of the documentation. Hey, the underscores are actually, they come and they become dashes. So that also takes uh, take a little bit. But it's, again, it's an unbelievable tool. So Highly recommend. All right, what are we doing here? We have one, two, three, four, five functions. And out of those five functions, we don't want to use all five at the same time. We want to use a combination of. So what do we want to say? We, we have an argument that is going to be the signal. We want to get a file. We want to read a CSV file. We want to read a parquet file, a JSON file, or a database. And depending on the argument, on the first argument that we pass into our function, we want to trigger an action. If none of these arguments are met, then we want to tell our users or ourselves, because this is for us at the end of the day, um, could not understand the argument, please use PQ for parquet files, DB for databases, JSON or CSV in lowercase. Um, all right. So, and, you know, if it's for yourself, you could also be a little bit mean. I told you to put this and, you know, like be very straightforward. I told you to use this. Um, all right. So then data extracted successfully. And now what we need to do is notice, if you, if you notice up here, we have write file, dot, dot, uh, SRC, dot engineering, extract, dot pi. So we are writing the file into our folder that is one level above the SRC. And then remember that if we are creating a framework, we're going to have a source folder. That source folder is going to contain everything that's going to be part of our Python package. If we're going to create a Python package that is going to be about data engineering, we definitely want to start with data engineering, and we want to have three modules, extract, transform, and load. Beyond that, we could say, OK, let's only have um, a module that let's have three files that have all of our files, and then let's just have one for a big command line tool. You could also do that afterwards. But we're doing it in steps to showcase what we can do with each. All right. So this is going to bring in this file, this extract file, into, let me zoom out a little bit there, into, into here. So as you can see, it says that it has been modified. It has a little M there. And um, so he's yelling at me. He's like, OK, what do you want to do now with this? And we have everything we want to know. The argument is the kind of data we're extracting, the URL for when we need to download files from somewhere. Uh, where is the data at, the path in? The path out, where is the data going to? The encoding, is this weirdly encoded? Tell me. Uh, file name, what is going to be the new name of the output file? And then query, are we querying a database? And if so, given the query. All right, a few things. Um, the things that I mentioned with typer, remember optional, type option, and then type that run. Three things, and you get yourself a command line tool. If you did not do something right, it's going to give you the most beautiful output ever. So let's try it out. If you are in VS Code and you press Control and the little tilde underneath the Escape button, you're going to open up your command line. Uh, your command line. If you open up your command line in VS Code or in Jupyter Lab, remember that it's not going to have your. Uh, it is most likely not going to have your environment loaded. So make sure if you install this with Conda, make sure you do activate and then whatever name you gave to your environment. I have for my environment PH uh, con for uh, Philippines conference. So I will activate it as such, but it's already activated. If you used VMV, then you will have to do source. 
uh, VM, and then you would do bin, and then you will run activate to activate your file. So make sure you are you have activated that because otherwise you won't be able to run typer because that is inside that folder or inside sorry that environment. All right. So let's start by running our um, uh, checking our command line tool. Let's see let's see what it does for us. So remember that we have all of these commands here. And say I want to start with, so I want to start, let me zoom in a little bit. I want to start with, I want to start with a CSV file. Let's start with a CSV file. So if I do Python, I, got, I have to point to the file that I want to read. So that's going to be in my source file, in our data engineering folder. And then there, we're going to use the extract uh, file. Then, the next thing that we want to do, we want to tell it, okay, what kind of file are we going to be reading in? Well, I'm going to use the argument for that, and I'm going to put, we're going to be reading a CSV. I'm going to go to the next line to make it more visible for everyone, so I'm going to put a backwards slash so that I can go to the next line in bash. So the next one is, I'm going to put the path in. Where is this file at, Ramon? And remember that even though there's an underscore here in path in at the top, is still only going to take a dash instead of the underscores. So I'm going to do path in. This file, Ramon, is in data, um, then so, and then so is the one that is going to be in the raw file, in the raw folder, and then there I have a CSV file. Okay, so now that you have the path in, where are you going to put this file at once you run it? So I'm going to say path out. I'm going to put it in the data folder, and I am going to put it into, I'm going to put it into that same folder. So, raw, and then that's it. That's all it wants. It just wants a path out. So I'm going to go to the next line, and then I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to say file name, or actually, let me, give the, let me tell it the encoding that it's going to use. And that is, for that file, ISO. And I forgot the rest. Let's see, it should be somewhere over here. There it is. So we have this file uses ISO 88591 um, for some particular reason. So we're just going to go with the flow for that. And then we are back here. We don't also, we don't need to put the quotation marks around it because everything passed inside the command line is still going to be a string. So we go to the next one, and we give it a file name. Remember the dash instead of the, instead of the underscore. File dash name. And then we're going to say testing CLI extract. You can give it whatever name you like. Then I'm going to put CSV. That's going to be the name. And then lastly, that's it. That's all we need for our command line tool. So if that worked out fine, we're going to see a... Um, a message saying that file was read successfully. So let's see. That I extracted successfully, and then if I check, if I do a list the files inside my data directory, inside the soul folder, inside the raw folder, there should be a testing CLI extract CSV. If I want to double, triple check that this actually worked, um, let's actually read it with pandas. Read. CSV, and then we're going to go to that same folder. Uh, we have to go one out because we are inside the, the notebooks folder. So we're going to go one out, data, so, raw, and then testing CLI. Oh, remember that we need to use the encoding. So that's good that we didn't put... Um, that we had an error there, so ISO. Let's 
Merci. Expect the one fill in line five, so two. So you see, we have an error here, which is great. Now we know whether it's working or not. So let's see what might this error be. I'm going to go into the Python, um, the IPython command line, and then I'm going to do import pandas there. I'm going to try to read it there. See if I'm missing something. Let's see. The beauty of live coding. So our file here Is anybody else getting an error? All right, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to figure out this error here in potentially the next break. But let's see what else can we do with this command line tool that we just created. So say, for example, I actually mess up here and I don't need an encoding because it's optional. Say I want to get rid of that encoding because I don't think my file is going to need it. And then I'm going to change this to extract two to make sure I don't override the one that I see errors with. It says that extracted successfully as well. So maybe the one that I was using is not the one that has the ISO, but the one that is already UTFA. So let's check that out to make sure the new one actually works. I don't need an encoding anymore. Oh, okay. Now I know what the, uh, what the problem was. So in the, in the file that we have here, we are loading a save data function because remember the first thing that we said two sections ago we said that if the data lives somewhere and we're going to do a data engineering project inside our laptops what we're going to need is to bring the data into our laptops in order to do that we're going to have to save it even if we are extracting we're still saving something there in order to do the next steps so one of the functions that we're using is in our next module in the loading module or two modules from now so this this function save data is actually saving it into a parquet file and I was trying to read a CSV file. So I was the one that did the, <laughs> that did the very silly mistake there of trying to read a CSV file that was not a CSV file. If we change this here, uh, let's see, come back here. OK, so if we change this from CSV to Parquet, even if it says CSV here, I think it will read it. Let's see. Yep, it will read it. Even if it says CSV. So talk about being confusing with your coworkers. If you were sharing this with somebody else, someone will be very mad with this stuff. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not cool, the fact that I saved a parquet file as a dot CSV. But our function works. Um, it doesn't account for every single human error, but that was good. We broke it. All right, so that's the first one. And before we, go, before we keep going, let's actually try to break it for a second. Let's see if it, if it will give us a... Um, Let's see if we do something weird, if it will give us a mistake. So say, for example, I put for this file encoding. Oops, I did not try to do that. Um, uh, 
say I put for encoding. Um, let's check types of encoding. I'm just going to put a dash b for whatever that is. If he, if he's going to read it as bytes, let's see. Okay, there you go. So we got an error. It doesn't understand. So this is the beauty of Typer. It already formats our even the errors look pretty, which you usually don't think an error is pretty whenever you get one. But at, at the end of the day, at least here he's telling me, look, Ramon, I don't know what this thing is. You did give me the encoding dash b, but I mean, what is that? Errors are strict. Is text true, false, blah, blah, blah. So he's basically trying to tell me. I don't understand what that is. Why did you give that to me? And then up ahead, it's actually telling you everything that it was expecting uh, from your, or the other things that could be keyword arguments from, uh, from that function that we just used to read, to read the file. So this is pretty neat, the fact that it tells us everything that we need and in a beautiful format. And all we had to do was add three things, the type that the function expects, the optional argument for typer and the typer that run. And then we have this nice little graph here with everything that was expected. So that's awesome. Um, now I know that I shouldn't make that mistake. If you go all the way to the top, you're going to see everything you put for all, of your, um, for all of your commands. And now we know that the query wasn't on, or we can see that the URL wasn't on. And then where I make the mistake was by, by putting that B over there, which clearly it doesn't like. So I'm going to come back here. So now, Something in which we could, something we could add in the future to our function is, if this is going to be a parquet file, don't freaking save it as a, CS, as a .csv extension. So that will be a, a, good, um, a good setup. So now I change the encoding. I go instead of E and I put UT, um, UTF-8. You shouldn't yell at me. There you go. That, that, that extract is successful. All right, so we can move on to the extract part of the workshop where usually in the extract, in the sorry, in the transform part of the workshop, what happens is that we have this data which is very scary and we want to make it into a way in which everybody can, uh, can take advantage of. If you remember, if you look at this, I don't know what that little question mark is over there or I don't want to have that. Like that information is important, the fact that it's meters per second and the fact that this is 10 meters, you can see up to 10 meters ahead of you, uh, the visibility. Temperature is in Celsius, so that's important because I believe the one for Washington DC is in Fahrenheit. And then megajoules over whatever that is. And then uh, milliliters and so forth. So it's good that we have that information, but it's not useful whenever we're trying to qu make a query. So one of the things that we want to do is, or some of the things that we want to do is, we want to account for uh, mismatching variables. We want to account for missing data. We want to account for things that uh, are wrongly formatted or things that are not going to be useful if we are trying to get a number out of it. So for example, if we're getting the mean, the average of something, the maximum value of something, we're not going to be able to do it if the thing is still a piece of text. So we're going to have to convert that. All right, let's see how we're going to do it. Also, I mentioned that one of the things that happen during the transform version of your pipeline is that you're trying to encapsulate a schema. The schema very often um, is, comes in two ways. So one is the star schema, and then another is the, um, uh, a very new one, is the um, activity schema. And the activity schema so it says that you're going to have one table to rule them all, where the name of each table is going to be um, attached to the key identifier, and one more thing that I forget what it is, and then everything can be mapped from that table on. So if you want to see what the star schema is, you have a fax table, something that is mapping one table with this table, with this table, with this table, with this other table. What happens with a fact table is that you can have duplicates in it. You can go from one row uh, being tied to one table to having another row being tied to the same table with a different uh, key uh, identifier. So you can get very, very um, you can get very wild quite quickly, but it's popular, it's useful, it gets the job done. The next one 
is the activity schema. We're not going to do either, but it's important to know about the, about the differences in between the two. This is something that can happen in the transform uh, part of your workflow. So the activity schema takes also one big table, but then, uh, so this is the, what they call the traditional modeling. You have a bunch of tables. One is for customers, products, um, inventory, logistics, locations, so forth. And then the other one is you have this massive um, activity stream, and then you have the timestamp. You have the activity. What is it that you're trying to capture from a particular set of columns or set of tables? And then you have those things that are coming, coming into, into one table. And it's pretty cool. The links are there, so make sure you check them. If you are going to be working with the schema of your employer, of the database of your employer, I think that will become uh, quite helpful. All right, so for the next one, we're going to, uh, let's evaluate an example. When we say miss, uh, bad columns or by, badly shaped columns, what do we mean? Well, say, for example, we have spaces in them, and then whenever we're trying to query a database, it's just less efficient to have spaces in your columns. Um, I remember when I, when I had one of the first cohorts that I, that I taught in Australia, all of my students would get the files into um, a word, underscore, another word, and everything in lowercase. And they will give me all the files back into uh, word, their name, space, their name, date, space, their year, space, and something else. And I'm like, ah, oh, give me something. And they were like, why do you always put underscore and, and lowercase? It's just easier to find the files in such a way and to share them than it is otherwise. Same for tables, same for columns, same for values. So we have postal codes here, we have cities, we have dates, and then we have dashes. One of the things that we want to do, or that we would prefer to do, if you have ever done regex, is that we just want to take the alphanumeric characters. So we want A to Z, and we want 0 to 9, and we want uppercase and lowercase. We want, um, I believe this is a space. Um, we want to keep the spaces, and we want to keep the underscore. But then, if you find any of those, actually put, um, change them for nothing. And then, make all of that lowercase. And then if there is another space that was saved from that one, change it to a lower, uh, to a underscore. I'm sure there is a more clever way to do that in here. Um, I am not the most, regex and I don't get along very well. So yeah, so I just said, yeah, I just put it twice. And then we have an index of columns. So a thing that we want to change the columns for. And then we have the columns. So we are doing a list comprehension there to get it done, and we are returning such a list. So the way in which we can test it is with that little toy example here that we haven't run. So this is our toy example. We have postal codes, cities. The cities have a little apostrophe there, or a little um, tick, and then um, dates as, has spaces and dashes and so forth. So if we clean it, then our columns come back, postal underscore codes, cities doesn't have anything at the end, and then dates as month, date, year. So that's useful. That's going to help us out for a little bit. So then the next one is sometimes. Um, remember that, for example, in particular, the, the London database has only one column that says timestamp. But for the purposes of this, um, of this analysis of what we're going to be doing, we need every hour, we need to know every single hour of, uh, and the count of bikes available in the city of London at every single hour for the date times that we have, for the date range that we have. So how do we do that? So we need to extract the date. We need to extract, sorry, the day, the month, the year, the time. And we need to get it to be able to do our analysis. So how do we do that? If our date time, our column, our date column is not already a date time type, which is a class in Python, then we want to convert it to such using the pandas function. We want to infer the data format just because we don't know, they might come in many different formats. We'll let pandas infer it, and the day it crashes, then we'll, we know we have to figure something out. Um, we are taking three parameters. We're taking the, the, the date column, because all of them have different names. We're taking the hour column, if there is one, because the London one, for example, doesn't have one. And then we're checking. If in our data, in the columns inside our data frame, there is not any of these names, hour, hour with capital R, HR, HR, uh, capital HR, if there's none of this turn out to be true, so look at the, see the not over there, then I want you to create a column. The way in which you create columns in pandas is in the same way in which you create a new key in a dictionary. You add the, that, uh, uh, 
square brackets, hour, and then you say for the data, uh, for the date column that I have in my data frame that I just added, I want to extract, I want to access the date type, the date time type of that column, and I want to extract the hour, and I'm going to add it back into my data frame. Then I want to sort the, because it's time series, sort the, the way in which the data set is arranged is extremely important. We don't want to have December 2020 at the, top of the, at the top of the table and then have at the bottom December 2015 and then at the very bottom December 2023. It's just not going to work. So we want to have it arranged by year, by hour, by, by date, and then by hour. And then so we're sorting those values. If the, so if the user provided the hour column, then we are actually going to use the hour column to, um, to, sort, to sort those values. And then, if there's nothing else, tell ourselves you must figure out how the hour works in your life. So then for the next one, we're going to add year, month, week, day, day, week, and is it the start of the month? Notice that I'm not adding, is it the end of the month? Because if it's not the start of the month, then I can assume that it's either the middle or the end. And I'm just interested if, it, if it's the start of the month. Then I'm going to drop that date column because I extracted every single attribute and I am still keeping the original date time variable. Then I'm going to return that data frame. And then I'm going to check it. I'm going to check it with the London data frame that we, lo that we loaded from the database a little bit ago. We're going to use the timestamp because that's the um, end. Of course, I forgot to load it earlier. Let's see, where are you? Okay, here's the London DF. And here's the timestamp. So it does seem to be order from 2015 and onwards. One, uh, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., so forth. So then we come back to our transform section. And now you can, you can see that we have... Um, Different, a different set of variables here. Variables here is month, star, day, month, uh, year, and then here, the hour, what we need. It's much easier to use the hour here than it is to use the hour within the date and the hour and the second and so forth. All right, so then we're going to do a couple more. Has anyone ever heard of something called one-hot encoding or dummy variables? What would it be? Ah, I'm going to move it down so you're going to read it. What is, um, what is one hot encoding? Have anybody heard of it that can exp uh, just share it with everyone? Or what is a dummy variable? So whenever we have an event that has happened and we want to represent it in some sort of way, we want to add a Yes, it's a, it's a placeholder value. So for example, if I have data from um, jo job ads for the last 10 years and I want to say whether a very unlikely event happen in that year, I might want to add a 1 to 2020 because of the pandemic, and then I might want to add, uh, say if I'm in Australia, I might want to add another one for 2019 because of the bushfires, and so forth. So it's a placeholder that is binary, is 1 or a 0, whether something happened or not. Another example is, if I have the seasons of the year, and say for example I have uh, a spring, fall, autumn, uh, fall uh, summer, and winter, and what I want to do is I want to capture each one of those and I want to make them a, a column. I'm going to use one for whether that it is that season of the year and zero if it isn't. So that way, if I need all seasons, I can keep one away because if three columns, summer, winter, and fall are zero, then I know that it is the spring. So I don't need to add that last column. So that is a domain variable. And this is called in machine learning parlance. Um, it's usually called one hot encoding. What we're doing is we're taking the data set and notice here that it says get dummies because it's exactly what you mentioned. It's a placeholder. So we're taking the data and then we're taking a list of columns that we want to um, domify and then we're allowing ourselves to pass more arguments if we wanted to later on. So then we check that this worked uh, with our sole data frame. So if we go all the way to the back, we took the seasons and then we took the holiday column so now we can see here that we have seasons spring, season summer, season winter. So now we know that 
All of these dates were for the winter, and of course we're going to have a zero in the other two. So it's a placeholder. And then for holiday or no holiday, we have the no holiday, which is going to be more common. There's way more non-holiday days in the year than there are holiday dates in the year. So we have non-holiday, and then we have a one for them. And then we're going to have a few zeros there. So, but the thing is that we only need one. All right. Lastly, we have three places. And if you remember, if you look at this data set, it doesn't really tell you that it's London in the UK. Just like it doesn't tell you if it's Washington DC or if it's Seoul, South Korea. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to add a location. So we want to have, we have the data here, we, and then we want to be able to add the place. And if we add the place, it's going to be populated to the entire column. So if it's London, there's going to be one big column with London in it. Then we test that it works, and we're going to do it with the Washington DC data set. So we go all the way to the back, and we see that location ID, the variable name that we gave it, says Washington DC. So all of that works. And then what if we have missing values? Or what if we want to get rid of a couple of, uh, a couple of columns? Well, what we can do is we can take the data frame. We can say, what columns do you want to fix? What mapping are you going to give them? And then what columns do you want to drop? So if I take in the same way as you would do with a dictionary, if you take a list of columns here, you say, I'm going to pass it to my data. Those are the columns that I want. And these columns that I want to fix, what I want to do is that I want to apply this mapping to it. And then, for example, here, because we cannot do a calculation with spring, we cannot do a calculation with summer, fall, or winter, what we want to do is that we want to add this mapping here. So wherever you find spring, I want you to give it a zero. Whatever you find summer, I want you to give it a one, fall, give it a two, winter, give it a three. So those columns to fix are going to receive that mapping. And then lastly, those columns to drop, that they're just not useful. So for example, we have the weather code here. What is the weather code? Let's see. Is this going to be London? What is the weather code? I think the weather code for this one, which I don't see it. Oh, it's because that's DC. Sorry. Here's London. So weather code here is the one that we are going to change. OK, yes, so weather code. <laughs> we are dropping the weather code because that is the one that we are changing. So oh no, we are changing season real, and then but we are going to change the weather code because that also applies for um, so we're going to have it duplicated. So we check the London head again. We see that the weather code is here. And then the season. So these two are not the same. Sorry, weather code is something else. We don't know what it is. We're just going to get rid of it because we cannot figure out what it is. So these are not the same. So then we have here our function, fix and drop, season, real, seasons London, <coughs> columns to drop, etc. So now you can see that we don't have weather code anymore, which was in between is holiday and wind speed. Is holiday and wind speed are not together. And then at the end, you can see that we have, let's see, season, Rio, uh, season, Rio. It doesn't seem to have fixed the mapping, but actually do it by hand. So London. Rio, season Rio. We can see that that's the winter. And if we take this function here, we apply a mapping can we actually change it this is our mapping seasons london and no and the reason being because i think this actually needs to be in the other way around. So if you have it,
then we can all change it together. This is a test, so this is not actually going to the, um, to the final output. So we're just checking that it will work if we wanted to use the function. So it's fine to catch those mistakes ahead of time. So winter is going to be a three. Now we come to the mapping. There you go. Now we have the three. So you have the key as the value that is already in the column. And then you have the value that you're going to change as the value in your mapping. So that one was reversed. But there you go. It, it, it works. And just to make sure that it actually works, let's go to the tail. We should have a different uh, time of the year, a different season. Or I guess not. Uh, let's go to somewhere in the middle. Let's see the shape of this data set. So it has 17,000. So let's see somewhere in the middle, just to make sure that our function actually, oh, actually, let's see the value counts. If we look at the value counts, then it's going to tell us how many are of each. OK, there you go. So we have the exact same values for summer, um, summer, fall, winter, spring. There you go. Cool. Our function works, which is what we wanted to do. And that was a small test. So now the last one is if we wanted to merge some of the files together, we could. But we might as well leave them as clean tables inside our data warehouse, which is what we're going to do later on with DocDB. All right, so here is the first exercise that I have um, for all of you. So I'm going to give you about five minutes before we go into the second break of today. And then, so the first thing that you need to do is pick two data sets. Remember that you have London DF already uh, loaded. Then you also have Washington what? DC. Yeah, DCDF, then you also have SOLDF, and you also have PortoDF. So you have four data sets loaded. And what you need to do is you, wa you, wanna, you wanna select five columns, for any five columns you want, and then you want to rename them appropriately, however you like. It could be hour, it could be time, whatever you wanna do. And then combine these two using the function order and merge. Why are we doing order? Well. If, the, if all of the files are going to have a different, kind, um, a different kind of ordering and a different kind of name for the columns, it, it follows that they're going to be distributed differently. So if we take one of them and we re-index the columns by the very first one that we pick, it doesn't matter, then we sort the values by date and hour, then we're going to be in a good shape because we are having the files be exactly in the same orders with the exact same columns. So, Pick, one that, pick two data sets, whichever you want from these four. Take five columns, whichever columns you want. One of the ways in which you can check out the columns if you have never used pandas. Or also, one of the ways in which you can check out all the functions in a Jupyter notebook if you have never done this is you can, if you are in Jupyter, in Jupyter Lab, you can use a tab completion to actually see what follows a function. And then the other thing that you can do is you can put um, double question mark next to, for example, I'm going to put read CSV, and I put uh, two question marks, and then it's going to give you all the source code for the function. So you're going to be able to see what the function does. And say, for example, you open it in a text editor, not mine. OK, there you go. You will be able to see examples as well for the function.